Hi, my name is Manish Gupta, and in this video, I'm going to talk about these uh, CANs or Kolmogorov or Nold networks, which have become suddenly pretty popular recently. Okay, so let me talk about how do you compare CANs with MLPs, multi-layered perceptrons, as most of you already know about. Right. So this table actually uh, shows you a very good comparison, but uh, let me try to sort of uh, uh, go over these elements in the table one by one. Okay. So, you know, more theoretis, the, 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 theoretical people can sort of understand that multilayered perceptrons have been motivated by something called as universal approximation theorem. CANs have been motivated by uh, Kolmogorov or null representation theorem, but that's more for, you know, academics. Now, uh, to really understand the difference, uh, look at this. So, in multilayered perceptrons, we sort of assume that a neuron has two parts. One is an integration function, and then an, app, uh, an uh, activation function is applied on top of it. Okay. So this is how a typical multi-layered perceptron layer looks like. There are these integration function weights, WIs, which needs to be learned, and they are weights on the edges in that senses. Right? And then you have a fixed activation function. Typically, it could be a sigmoid function or a ramp function or you know step function, a ReLU function, and so on. So, so these activation functions are typically fixed, and uh, uh, they are on the nodes. And uh, the, the point is that you don't need, they don't have any learnable weights in them. There's no learnability in activation functions. Okay? So that's uh, that's a typical formula for a shallow MLP. Right? Now, um, and of course, in MLPs, you could basically have multiple layers. For example, three layers in this MLP. And uh, these three layers sort of then represent a composition on top of the original input X. So if you supply the original input X, you could have your weights W1 in your first layer and then apply an activation function sigma1, have weights W2 in the second layer, apply activation function sigma2, and then have more weights and apply activation function or not, and so on. Okay. So the entire MLP is more like a composition over learnable weights Ws and fixed activation functions alpha uh, sigmas represented here. Okay. Now let's look at uh, what happens in CANs. Okay, so in uh, so you know while MLPs have fixed activation functions on the nodes, CANs actually have learnable activation functions, and that is what differentiates them. So that's the first level of differentiation. Okay, so you know uh, similar to uh, a layer in MLPs, this is a layer in CANs. Okay? So in CANs, essentially you uh, start with the input. Here there are two particular inputs. You know, start with the input. And then uh, you actually have, uh, uh, of course, you are doing some sort of a sum, uh, but there are no fixed weights W. In fact, there are no learnable weights W, okay? Uh, but that's another thing, we'll get, get to that. But the more important point is that these activation functions are also learnable. Okay? So these activation functions are learnable, they're not fixed, okay? Second, CANs do not have any linear weights, so there's no W. So unlike MLPs, which have learnable weights W, you know, there are no learnable weights here. In fact, uh, they are replaced by univariate function parameterized as a spline. Okay. Now that was a too, much, too much math, so let me try to simplify that. The idea is that rather than having a, a learnable weight W there, what you have is a function, learnable function on each of those edges. You still have the same number of edges. So for example, you'll still have two into five edges, okay? So you still have those two into five edges, sorry. Okay, you still have two into five edges. But the point is that rather than having a fixed W, you will actually have a function in that senses, uh, which is used to compute the weight on that edge in that senses, okay? So, and if you want to use scans, you know, there's a simple library called as PyCAN, and you can just do pip install PyCAN, okay? Now, the point is, why do you have this kind of an architecture? And uh, what does this give you, okay? So let's try to understand it uh, appropriately. So rather than actually having Ws and Sigma, rather than having these Ws and Sigma, where Ws are learnable weights and Sigma are fixed activation functions, CANs actually have, you know, uh, uh, these, these spline-based functions phi, you know, these spline-based functions phi, you can call them as phi QP. It's after all a matrix in that sense, right? And then you also have these learnable activation functions phi Q. Okay. So you have two kinds of learnable things here, learnable activation functions and also learnable, uh, you know, splines here. Okay. They operate on your X. So your input X or XP, you can call the input as X, XP, you know, where P, uh, so, so there are two, two things here, right? X1 and X2. So, um, so in that sense is, and what these uh, uh, phi functions are going to do, are they're going to basically be applied on those P's so as to give you Q outputs here, Q outputs here, 
Um, and uh, then you sum over all of those Q outputs, of course, just to uh, or, or rather sum over, you know, these, these two things, for example, for each of those neurons in, in general. And then you apply activation functions just to finally get your final output f of x. Okay. Now, of course, you could also do composition over several of these layers, as you see here. So you can do composition over several of those of these layers, and uh, that gives you uh, the same kind of uh, can output as you can get. Uh, each of these phi's basically that you see here, phi functions is basically just a number. Phi QP is one number. So effectively, uh, you know, when you uh, have uh, a particular can layer, uh, these uh, phi QP's, all of them, if you basically look at it, they basically give you a matrix phi. And then on top of that, you basically apply uh, a linear uh, vector of, of weights called phi Q. So basically, again, each of those phi is a number by itself. But those numbers are in general obtained uh, as, as a composition function using splines, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Okay. So the broad idea is that uh, cans have no linear weights. They basically have each weight, meta, weight parameter decided using the spline, uh, which is a polynomial function of some sorts, right? And then, uh, you know, they don't have fixed activation functions. They have learnable activation functions. Okay. So, so, you know, why do this, right? So this is basically done so that you basically have CANs as networks which are better than MLPs in terms of accuracy. Now, why do they give you better accuracy? Uh, because of two reasons. So, you know, CANs actually are a combination of MLPs and splines. Okay. In general, what they have is multi-layered uh, kind of a structure, and therefore you can say that they are also MLPs because they have multi-layered architecture in that sense. But, you know, internally, each of those weights are actually defined using splines by themselves. Okay. Now, what splines do, the splines are actually one-dimensional functions, as I'll talk about on the next slide. Okay. But the interesting part is that the splines actually are very accurate for low-dimensional functions, and they are easy to adjust locally. They are pretty good from a low-dimensionality perspective. In general, CANs actually use one-dimensional splines. Okay. So, or, or rather, well, they can actually also use higher-dimensional, but they are polynomial functions, they're low-dimensional in that sense. Okay. Uh, but they suffer from curse of dimensionality because of their inability to sort of exploit compositional structures. So they can actually not really represent uh, uh, compositions over those functions and so on. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, MLPs actually suffer less from this curse of dimensionality, but they are less accurate in low dimensions. So therefore, in CANs, which is a combination of MLPs and splines, uh, you know, uh, you basically get the best of both the worlds. Okay. So this is the same figure from the previous slide, where essentially, uh, you know, you uh, this is a one layer can in that sense. Is now you can think about it as two layers or one layer, but the point is that it, it, this is equivalent to a one layer MLP, right? So, so here what you see is that each of these phi's is basically a spline, okay? Uh, and what is a spline? Well, it, or rather this phi of x is basically defined as this. It's wb b of x plus ws spline of x, where b of x is basically your typical standard activation function in that sense, is, plus, uh, you know, the, a, a spline is basically represented as a summation or multiple bi's, which are in general basis spline functions, okay? Uh, now, you know, again, uh, how splines are defined and so on is beyond the scope of this video. You, know, you can look at it later. But the whole point is that in MLPs, you have W's and sigmas where W's are linear and sigmas bring in the nonlinearity. But CANs have these phi's, uh, you know, both for integrating over multiple inputs as well as for activations. And that basically makes them uh, nonlinear overall net net. Okay. Now, if you really look at the parameters involved in training splines, it's basically this WB, this WS, which needs to be trained, and then, of course, these CIs, which need to be trained. Okay, So there are these WBs, WS, and CIs, which are trainable. Okay, Now, uh, uh, so basically, if I look at a, a multi-layered network using CANs, let's say if the depth of the network is L, and each layer has equal width N, N neurons in that sense is per layer, right? So each spline uh, basically of order k. Now order k basically saying you know this this spline function basically can be a sum over uh, you know uh, polynomial of degree one, degree two, degree three, degree k, and so on, right? So of order k uh, on g interval. So now uh, you know these spline functions basically have two interesting things. One, they can be of certain orders, and they also have like you know grid points or intervals. So how fine grained your spline is in that sense, okay? So, so higher accuracy basically requires uh, finer intervals, which basically means more grid points in that sense. Okay. So, so you know, so basically G intervals requiring G plus one grid points 
in that sense is you know each of this function phi will sort of require um, a, 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 you see l into g plus uh, so the, each of these uh, each of these uh, uh, functions will require g plus k different parameters to be uh, to express that particular phi value okay and now you know you see basically you require phi qp in the sense that uh, if n is the width of your layer then you require n cross n such phi's in that sense and therefore require n square g plus k just to represent those phi's uh, of course, you require some of them for WB and WS and so on, but those can be subsumed in the squared thing, right? And then since there are L layers, you require L. So that basically means that CANs actually require N square LG parameters of that order. Yeah. On the other hand, an equivalent MLP will just require N square L because remember those Ws are fixed, right? In that sense, I mean, well, they're learnable, but they're just Ws, right? The, uh, yeah, then one W, you actually have G plus K points here. Okay. So it looks like CANs actually have a uh, much larger uh, you know, complexity in that sense. But the interesting point is to be able to achieve the same kind of accuracy, interestingly, CANs usually require much smaller N than MLPs, which means much smaller number of neurons. And therefore, in general, it turns out that CANs can actually give you similar accuracies with smaller sized networks, as we'll see uh, in the next few slides. Okay. Now you see, um, um, uh, if you basically cannot really good, very good, get very good accuracy using a smaller MLP, what do you do? You typically uh, retrain the MLP, uh, another MLP, with a slightly larger number of layers or larger number of neurons per layer. Okay. In uh, CANs, what can you do? You can actually progressively train them. You don't need to train another CAN from scratch. Okay. So what you could do is that if you basically were representing each of those phi's using uh, uh, you know uh, splines of a particular order and of a particular uh, uh, you know um, uh, grid, what you could do is to really extend your grid. So what you could do is to basically uh, make the spline more accurate by using fine-grained grid. So it's like fitting a new fine-grained grid uh, using an old coarse-grained grid. And that's basically incremental or progressive rather than training completely from scratch. Okay, So the idea is that it, you could increase parameters in CANs without retraining from scratch, and that makes them really awesome. Okay. Um, so broadly, uh, you know, unlike MLPs, CANs actually have uh, external degrees of freedom and internal degrees of freedom, which makes this capacity usage in terms of number of parameters really optimal in that sense. The external degrees of freedom, what I mean is uh, uh, CANs, uh, you know, you can actually control how nodes are connected, just like MLPs, right? So MLPs also have external degrees of freedom, but splines do not have them. And uh, therefore, CANs, which are a combination of splines plus MLPs, are really awesome, okay? So they actually help learn those compositional structures of multiple variables, that hierarchy uh, of, of discovery of features in that sense, right? CANs also have internal degrees of freedom, which basically means the number of grid points inside an activation function, okay? So which basically, of course, splines also have, but MLPs do not have, unfortunately, right? So, so and they're responsible for learning univariate functions, okay? So, so therefore, you know, CANs, which are a combination of splines and MLPs, basically enjoy both external and internal degrees of freedom, giving them the flexibility of learning both the awesome univariate functions and also good composition over multiple variables, okay? Uh, now, in MLPs, you could actually do regularization, right? I mean, uh, so uh, using, let's say, L1 loss, okay? So in CAS, how would you do it? Of course, if you were to do it, uh, you know, in CANs, you would do it this way. You would actually take the CAN parameters and then regularize on top of them. Uh, you know, uh, clearly, if you have like, uh, uh, but, 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 you know, in general, people have observed that in CANs, L1 regularizer does not really work that well. What you really need is uh, an entropy-based regularizer, which is defined like that. And then, you know, when you're training overall CAN end-to-end, -end, what you would end up doing is basically to train this overall loss, which is basically your prediction-based loss. It could be a cross-entropy loss or whatever loss you have, right? Plus lambda times, uh, you know, a combination of your L1 loss and an entropy-based loss, okay? And an entropy-based loss, okay? Okay, so how do CANs perform? Okay, so uh, these folks basically have uh, shown really awesome results on theoretical functions. So they basically say they basically generate synthetic data sets uh, using uh, these uh, uh, these uh, tasks for that matter. So there are five different tasks that you see here. Okay. Uh, so a uh, five different uh, machine learning tasks, so to say, and they're trying to approximate those functions using uh, can uh, using can networks. Okay. So what you observe is that uh, they train a CAN of depth two, and they also train MLPs of various depths, uh, and uh, you know um, for all of those five different functions. So what do you observe here? You observe, uh, uh, and on on the x-axis you basically have number of parameters. You know, so CANs of depth two, but different number of parameters, right? On the y-axis you have test RMSE. So the lower the better, the lower the better. Okay. So what you observe here is that. Uh, Unlike these MLPs, you know, which basically, even if you increase the number of parameters, uh, you see the RMSE is not decreasing, you know. 
So on the other hand, for CAMs, typically you get way better mean squared error, way lower mean squared error compared to MLPs. Okay. So I'm broadly saying that CANs are better than multi-layered perceptrons in that sense. On top of that, CANs are interpretable as well. Okay. So for example, if you basically wanted to do a multiplication of two features X and Y, okay, how would you do it using CANs? So the way it basically CANs do it is uh, by splitting it into X plus Y square minus X square plus Y square. And from school days, you would remember that this would actually give you multiplication between X and Y. Okay. So, and you can actually visualize it interestingly. So for example, you can actually see uh, that uh, this particular, uh, you know, uh, activation function is just computing uh, X plus Y, and then on top of that, it's doing, doing square, okay? On the other hand, this guy is basically squaring this guy, uh, X square plus Y square, uh, you know, the other other uh, neuron, you know, it's basically taking X square plus Y square. And remember, X square plus Y square is possible because you have an activation function there, okay? It's doing X square plus Y square, you know, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, after that, it's basically uh, just adding those up. It's it's just adding those up, right? So as to essentially uh, uh, finally get X into Y, okay? So that's the interpretability part of GAN, okay? Further, you could also do look at other things. Like for example, if you wanted to do division, how would you do it? Well, you could just do log x minus log y and then take exponent, okay? So what you could do is to basically take log x, right? And you can do log y or rather do minus log y in that sense. And then, you know, you just do a simple addition. So log x minus log y. And then you could take an exponent on top of that. So as to essentially get your x divided by y. So cancer interpretable, okay? Interestingly, in the paper, they also show uh, examples uh, of two problems in maths and physics, how they were able to discover laws, you know, directly by actually looking at uh, empirical data and then running them through GANs. Okay. In fact, what they also discovered is that uh, while you could build GANs, uh, uh, very fancy GANs uh, to do complicated functions like these. So let's say if you have two inputs, U and V, and you wanted to implement U plus V divided by one plus UV, you can actually build complicated GANs. But uh, uh, interestingly, of course, if you keep training them, uh, CANs can actually discover interesting equalities and then uh, therefore learn smaller uh, networks themselves. So for example, a human would code up this CAN as follows. A human would basically say that first let me compute U into V and take two layers to do that, uh, you know, like that, like that. Okay? And then what you could do is to do division. So one, uh, one divided by one plus UV and then use a particular layer like that, you know, this particular layer. Okay. And then further, what you could do is to basically multiply these two things using two layers, uh, of course, you know, like that. And then you have like a five layer can to basically compute the entire function. However, uh, cans can automatically discover this uh, this equality that uh, u plus v divided by one plus uv is 10 hyperbolic of arc 10 uh, hyperbolic u plus arc 10 hyperbolic v. Okay? And that can be actually computed using just two layers. Okay? So five layer can can actually be compressed into two layers uh, automatically. Okay. And that's the beauty of the CAN framework. Okay. Now you might be thinking, hey, uh, you know, uh, 10 years back, I learned that MLPs are awesome. So should I be using CANs or should I be using MLPs? And here is an interesting flowchart to basically tell you whether you should be using CANs or MLPs. Okay. Uh, again, you know, more or less from all of this, you basically see that uh, CANs are good for accuracy, CANs are good for interpretability, and CANs are also good for efficiency, okay, compared to MLPs. Broadly, of course, you can look at this, uh, uh, you know, in detail when you have more time. But broadly, what I can tell you is that if you want faster training, that is the only situation, okay? So faster training is the only situation when you should basically, you know, uh, surely, surely look into MLPs, okay? Otherwise, in most cases, you know, either choice does not matter or you could basically just go ahead with CANs, okay? Of course, if you're using some pre-trained models and so on, CANs are not that great because there are no pre-trained CANs at the moment. But, you know, if you're basically training from scratch uh, MLPs, then you would rather train CANs in that sense, okay? Um, uh, simple to use, PyCAN library, okay? So in summary, in this video, I talked about CANs. You know, they are not, they have non-linear functions everywhere. Uh, they're a combination of MLPs and splines. Uh, they are actually better, they have been uh, shown to be better than MLPs on small data sets in that sense. Uh, they're highly interpretable and they can help discover maths or physics laws, okay? Um, I think, will CANs become mainstream? Well, that uh, time will tell, uh, but uh, they seem to be doing uh, better than MLPs. And it's nice to know how they compare with MLPs, okay? Okay, hope you liked the video. Thank you for watching. Connect with me on my LinkedIn or look at my research on my homepage. Thank you.